Good morning, everyone, again, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church, because First Presbyterian is wherever the people of First Presbyterian are worshiping. We, as always, want to be a community that sees one another and cares for one, one another and shines out our abundant gift that God has given us. So if you need support, if you have a prayer request or you uh, want to join the prayer chain so that you can be praying over others, please contact the church office and we'll get you connected. If you uh, are in need of a listening ear or you want to get connected with others in ministry at First Presbyterian, uh, there's a list at the end of your bulletins that you can see who the church officers are to reach out to those folks uh, so you can get connected. We want to be able to have every member in ministry here at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, speaking of church officers, uh, we are excited to celebrate an installation this morning uh, of a new deacon. Uh, so that uh, has gotten added over the course of the week, and we're excited to be able to finally install uh, Robin Bowerly as a deacon. Uh, and just as always, there is so much that's happening within the life of uh, a First Presbyterian Church, and we hope that you will continue to find ways to, um, to get engaged and to care for one another and care for our community as we grow together uh, along the way of God. And with that, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please hear our call to worship this morning. Listen. I have a story to tell, a story of a God who longed for justice, a story of a God who pushed back the waters to make dry land, a story of a God who would not take no for an answer when it came to the safety of God's own. For God's people were suffering, God's people were crying out, God's people were shackled and bound by oppression. So God said to Moses, speak let my people go. And Moses spoke over and over again. Moses stood up for justice, but over and over again, Pharaoh said no. Power said no. The path to justice is never easy, is it? The path to change is never a straight line, is it? So like Rosa, who sat on the bus, and Martin, who had a, a dream, Moses, Moses kept trying. God kept speaking, Moses kept listening, hope kept breathing, and when power tried to unravel justice, the people kept dreaming. God longed for justice. God still longs for justice. So let us worship God, for human injustice will never be strong enough to unravel God's dream that all might be free and all might know love. Let us worship holy God. Please join our voices in singing all creatures of our God and King. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
But when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin with, a response, with our responsive prayer of confession found in the bulletin. God, you have asked us to be like Moses, standing up for your people, standing up for justice. But too often we are like Pharaoh, holding on to power or holding on to privilege. God, you ask us to be like Aaron, who stood by his brother to unravel systems of oppression. But too often we align with Pharaoh, saying no to change and unraveling your vision for justice and peace. Forgive us for all the ways we stand on the wrong side of history. Forgive us for the harm we do to your planet and for the harm we do to your children. Help us to be like Moses. Forgive us when we are like Pharaoh. Amen. Friends, hear the good news of our faith. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, showing compassion to all. Forgiven and freed, let us live as children of God. Know in your heart today that we are forgiven and be at peace. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, starting at chapter 5, verse 1. Our story and God's story continue with these words. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go so that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should heed him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. And then moving to chapter 7, verse 8. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a wonder, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and they became snakes. But Aaron's staff swallowed up theirs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand at the river bank to meet him and take in your hand the staff that was turned into a snake. Say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you to say, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. See, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall be turned to blood. The fish in the river shall die, the river itself shall stink, and the Egyptians shall be unable to drink water from the Nile. The Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over its rivers, its canals, and its ponds, and all its pools of water, so that they may become blood, and there shall be blood throughout the whole land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood 
and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and of his officials, he lifted up the staff and struck the water, and all the water in the river was turned into blood, and the fish in the river died. The river stank so that the Egyptians could not drink its water, and there was blood throughout the whole land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not, e and he did not take even this to heart. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are in a new worship series called Unraveled, Seeking God When Our Plans Fall Apart. Last Sunday, we dug into the story of the disciples being caught in that terrible storm on the sea. It was a story of Jesus walking toward the disciples through the storm, of a courageous moment of stepping out toward Jesus, of doubt and sinking, and then ultimately of Jesus's presence and words of assurance. We know storms in our lives. We have, it, we have experienced the unraveling of assumptions and expectations week after week lately. And yet God continues to be present in it all and reweaving us into something whole and holy. This morning, we continue our unraveled theme with the story of God working through Moses and Aaron to confront the Pharaoh and demand the release of the oppressed into freedom. And there's a lot of unraveling that's happening in the story. There is the unraveling of Moses's expectations for how Yahweh's plan will unfold. There's the unraveling of the Hebrew people's identity as slaves and the reweaving of their story into that as the people of God. But this morning, I would like to invite us to be brave and maybe a little uncomfortable. And so while we might be used to reading this story from the perspective of Moses or Aaron or the Hebrew people, today I'd like to invite us in to enter into the story of unraveling from the perspective of the Pharaoh. To understand why I'd like to share an excerpt from an article by the author and preacher Erna Kim Hackett. This is what she writes. White Christianity suffers from a bad case of Disney princess theology. As each individual reads scripture, they see themselves as the princess in each story. They are Esther, never Xerxes or Haman. They are Peter, but never Judas. They are the woman anointing Jesus, never the Pharisees. They are the Jews escaping slavery, never Egypt. For citizens of the most powerful country in the world who enslaved both native and black people to see itself as Israel and not as Egypt when studying scripture is a perfect example of Disney princess theology. And it means that as people in power, they have no lens for locating themselves rightly in scripture or society. And it has made them blind and utterly ill-equipped to engage issues of power and injustice. It's some very weak Bible work. There's so much that we can learn from the word of God as long as we're open to the transformation that comes with it. As the Apostle Paul once wrote, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. And yet if we limit our understanding of scripture, if we avoid imagining ourselves in the position of those with power and responsibility, then we can limit the transformative work that's possible through God's great story. If we only imagine ourselves in the perspective of Moses, we can avoid taking responsibility for the hard, messy, ongoing work of recognizing our complicity in societal sin and it can harden our hearts to God's call to change the systems of power so that others may flourish too. So church, I'd like to invite us all to take a nice deep breath, breathe in the spirit of God, breathing in deeper than we have all day, and breathe it all the way out. And as we continue to breathe in the spirit of God, 
like to invite us to use our sanctified imaginations to locate ourselves in the position of the Pharaoh. A few thousand years ago, ruling over the powerful empire of Egypt. Imagine. As the Pharaoh, we were born into this position of privilege. It's all we've ever known. We've been raised to believe that we deserve to hold power over others because we've earned it. Imagine, we are the Pharaoh. And it's true, much of our wealth and power has come at the expense of others. Many, many generations ago, another ruler had grown concerned about the Hebrews who were living in Egypt. It was feared that those people were becoming too numerous and powerful. And so they were forced into a position of slavery and oppression, all to secure our Egyptian control and to make them work for our advantage. Of course, there was always a justification for it. As a pharaoh in the making, we were encouraged to harden our hearts and to avoid being in solidarity with the oppressed. There was always an explanation for why they didn't deserve our comforts. As our predecessors would have said, the Hebrews are just not like us. They're more violent than we are. They're not as intelligent as we are. They must not work as hard as we do because they haven't earned the resources or status that we've earned. Our worldviews, of course, are shaped by the stories we tell, by the voices we listen to, by the lens we use to interpret the world around us. And when we don't stop to think critically and compassionately about what it is that we believe, we can end up with hardened hearts, unable to recognize how our beliefs and stories are hurting us and those around us. To be honest, it's good to be the Pharaoh and it's not. Sure, there's a sense of being in control and having luxuries that others couldn't dream of, but it also comes with that hardened heart and a lifeless pursuit of not losing power. There's an assumption that there's only so much power to go around, so if anyone else gains advantages or freedom, it might mean less for us. It's good to be the powerful Pharaoh, but it also comes with a sense of division and loneliness and frustration that comes hand in hand with the system of hierarchy and exclusion. And then one day, while we're trying to hold on to our power as Pharaoh, Moses comes in and declares that the God of the Hebrews demands that we let the Hebrew people go into the wilderness and worship their God, Yahweh. Seriously? This guy, Moses, had been raised in our same royal household. We didn't even really think of him as a Hebrew. And now he's returned from the wilderness to betray us. What does he expect us to do? Does he really expect us to let go of control? As the Pharaoh, it's really just too much to take. He's asking us to unravel our worldview, our system of power, and our understanding of our identity. It seems only natural that when someone asks us to let our lives unravel like that, that we would be, that we would react by hardening our hearts a little bit more. Hearing, listening to the cries of the oppressed could change our lives. Hearing the story from a different lens could rattle our way of being. To release the oppressed could drastically reduce our power and control. And we don't want to upset other Egyptians with privilege. Who knows what could happen if we allowed our hearts to soften to the plight of the Hebrews. Everything that we've built our lives on could fall apart. So what do we do? If we imagine ourselves in Pharaoh's shoes, how would we hope that we would respond to God's call to free the Hebrew people? As I've been sitting with this story this week, I've been reflecting on how often we hear this story and we assume that Pharaoh had no choice. We treat him like he is this mindless villain who is never capable of choosing God's way of life abundant. Often when we hear this story, we treat the Pharaoh like he's not human like us, like he was not capable of vulnerability or compassion or redemption. I suppose in separating ourselves from him, it can let us off the hook. 
If the Pharaoh was just a mindless villain, then we don't have to notice our own responsibilities to the injustices of our own context. If the Pharaoh was not capable of choice, then we don't have to face the choices in front of us. We don't have to feel any responsibility for the story that we're living out that continues injustice today. For the disparities that result in COVID-19 being twice as deadly to Black and Latinx populations than to the white population. Or for the truth that six out of 10 African Americans and Native Americans have, immediate, have an immediate family member who has been in jail or prison or that of all U.S. agricultural land, 96% of it is owned by white owners. If we don't imagine Pharaoh could change, then we don't have to imagine ourselves in his position, and we don't have to harden our, and then we can harden our hearts from considering how God is seeking to unravel our own societal sins. But what if we, the Pharaoh, do have the ability to make choices and to be transformed? Church, let's take a moment to breathe in the spirit and connect with God. And as we breathe, consider what God might be teaching you through this story today. Reflect on your own experience. When have you witnessed people crying out for justice and hardened your heart to what they were going through? Why does it sometimes seem safer to harden our hearts to suffering and injustice rather than listening and engaging? What would it be like in practice to allow our hearts to soften in such a time as this? What would need to unravel in your life? What steps is God calling you to take in the next week or the next month? For any of us here who hold the privileges that come with being white in a world colonized by whiteness, and for all of us here who are trying to follow God in a world that still knows a hierarchy of exclusion and injustice, please hear this good news. If there is anything that we can learn from our story with God, it is that God is in it and inviting us to return to the way of Shalom. We can, be born in, we can be born into a world that is set up to benefit some and marginalize others, and yet that is not the end of the story. We confess that we many times have hardened our hearts to the suffering of other people, and still God is inviting us to soften our hearts and to discover a new way. Like so many who have gone before us, we have a choice. We have the agency to interrupt stories of oppression and to choose instead the way of God's abundant grace. And I get that it's hard in the middle of the struggle because it can feel so overwhelming to imagine facing the suffering of the world and changing course to repair it. And the truth is that the work of redemption is not a one-time event and it's not easy. It takes trusting in God's shalom abundance. It takes relentlessly seeking to do God's will in a world that's been set up to fav in favor of people with power. It takes staying true to God's work of compassion and justice even when it's not popular with your friends or with people in power. And yet God is here with us. This is our story with God. God is with us all, inviting us to pay attention to what needs to unravel, and God is with us, reweaving us all into a tapestry of shalom. Beloved Church of God, may we soften our hearts and follow God's way of grace. May it be so. Amen. And please join me in our second hymn.
are many ways to respond to God's faithfulness, love, and mercy in our lives. We come now seeking to be faithful disciples of Jesus and to respond to God through our tithes, gifts, and offerings. At the end of the bulletin, you will find information on how to share your financial gifts for the ministry of the church. You will also find lists of leaders in our congregation's ministries. We all have gifts to shine out for the glory of God. Please reach out and find ways we can shine together. All right, and now we come into the time of the prayers of the people. So as I come, as we come to, to God in prayer, when I say, Holy One, in your love and mercy, I'd like to invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Holy One, spark of life, creation was envisioned by you and is sustained by you. In gratitude, we pray for the world that its riches and resources be used responsibly and fairly, that its rulers and leaders may govern with justice, compassion, and humility, that humankind may live with understanding and respect, noticing what unites us. In your love and mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, prophet of love, you lived among us to teach us, to show us how to love. In humility, we pray for siblings around the globe, for those dehumanized by their struggle for existence. May we listen. For those overshadowed by the constancy of death, may we notice. For those besieged by fear, anger, and relentless peril, may we show up. For those ensnared by systems beyond their control, may we demand change. In your love and mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, breath of being, you are here in this very moment as constant presence and insistent voice. In gratitude we pray, with boldness we pray. Inundate the world with humanity. Overwhelm the world with truth. Flood the world with kindness upset our indifference, accelerate our action, fortify our resolve, compel us to authentic discipleship that nurtures creation, embodies love, and breathes life. In your love and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we join our voices wherever they are to pray the New Zealand prayer book version of the Lord's Prayer, which is found in our bulletins. Let us say together, Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings, your commonwealth of peace and freedom, sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In the times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. And now we get to celebrate the installation of a new church officer. Uh, I want to make sure that, um, that Robin can... Uh, that Robin is here and that you can unmute yourself, right? Okay. All right. This is very exciting. Uh, you probably remember back in February, we installed our other church officers and we knew that Robin was going to be a little late for some other circumstances. And then all of a sudden, uh, COVID happened and we found ourselves in mid-July when we were installing her. So we are excited to officially um, install you as a, uh, a deacon of First Presbyterian Church this morning. So uh, Robin, let's make sure that you can unmute yourself.
Mm, that was your video. <laughs> we lost your video. There we go. Okay, we lost your video though. There you go. <laughs> we got your video back, but you're muted now. Do you see at the bottom of the screen? Okay, perfect. Okay, we got you. Good. <laughs> All right. So this is a first, an installation over Zoom. So uh, we adapt as we go, don't we? All right. So I, um, good. I'm glad that we have you or that you're able to unmute yourself. Um, and now I, uh, I'd like to invite us all to join in the sentences of scripture uh, that are in our bulletins. There are different gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are a variety of ways to serve God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through people in different ways, but it is the same God who inspires a faithful response. Each one is given gifts by the Spirit to use for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ. We are called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the Church, some are called to a particular service as deacons, as elders, as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. I'd like to invite Jim to, uh, to speak representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of First Presbyterian Church now installs Robin Bowerly to active service in this congregation as a deacon. Thank you, Jim. And now Robin, I have some questions for you. All right. <laughs> All right, make sure that you speak up so that everybody, so that if, if you're in speaker view or if people are, have you in speaker view, they see you, okay? Okay. Good. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Robin, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? I do and I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture? And will you be, con and be, con excuse me, and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? I will. And last one. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? I will. All right. Now for our, con our congregational questions. Do we, 
the members of the church accept this friend as deacon chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? We do. Do we agree to pray for her, to encourage her, to respect her decisions, and to follow as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? We do. All right, so as we adapt our installation to uh, to Zoom, we can't have our uh, our elders and, uh, and ministers of word and sacrament to come forward for a laying of hands. So instead, I would like to invite everyone to hold a hand or two of blessing up to your webcam so that we can be um, blessing Robin from all of our different places, okay? All right, let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your servant whom you have called through baptism as your own and marked as your own. Grant her the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give her a spirit of truthfulness that she may show the compassion of Christ in the actions of daily living and rightly govern your people. Give her the gift of your Holy Spirit to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people and to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for the work of the ministry, give to your servant gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility, humor and courage, and an abiding sense of your presence. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain this congregation in ministry, ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, Strengthen our service to the outcast and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together, that we may be servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Robin, you are now officially installed as a deacon in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Let us welcome Robin to her new leadership role with some sign language applause. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <all. laughs> Very good. All right. And now let us join in our final hymn, uh, Restless Weaver.
Jesus has told us who needs Jesus has told us who needs to care. As you go out into God's world, keep your eyes open for those who are hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, or imprisoned. See Christ in them and join with them in love. And remember that you are God's beloved. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Christ's compassion shines forth in what you do. Live as those who know and have experienced God's goodness. Go now in peace. Mm -hmm.